Welcome to the Brand Theory Podcast, the podcast for helping you uncover your passion, realize your purpose, and take the aligned action. Together, we're going to prove the theory that when we live our lives on brand, the possibilities become limitless. I'm your host, Danielle Marchesi, branding expert and business coach. Let's get started. Welcome back to another episode of the Brand Theory Podcast. Today, we're talking to Ari K. We're going to go with Ari K because I'm definitely going to butcher her last name. She is a design queen mentor speaker, and she helps transform websites into a goldmine for femtech. DTC and women-led brands. I want to cover a little bit more about her before we jump into that interview, but I also just wanted to give you a quick brand tip before we get into this amazing conversation. I've been doing a lot of guest speaking in panels on some other podcasts and just with my clients, speaking with them as well about when is it time to do a little brand refresh? How do we know it's time to make some adjustments to our back end, make some adjustments to our physical brands, such as our logos or our fonts or all that pretty stuff that our clients may see. Well, how do we know it's time to do some brand adjusting, brand auditing, if you will? And I think the biggest thing, there's a bunch of things that that might be a sign that it's time, but the biggest thing that I always want people to look for is the feeling of when you're talking about your brand or when you're talking about your most sellable service, when you're talking about what it is that you do, how do you feel? If you feel there's some kind of disconnect, if you feel not as excited as you maybe once did, if you feel just a little bit lost about where to go next, or you're talking about a service that you've sold for a year and a half and you're just feeling a little bit stale to you, that conversation, if that conversation feels stale, if your marketing feels stale, if just this overall feeling of eh, that is a huge indication that it is time for a refresh and a refresh, a rebrand always starts with a brand audit. So if you are feeling this way, if you're feeling eh, for lack of better words, about your brand and your business, your marketing strategy and everything in between, don't forget we are having a spring sale of our auditing packages. And really what that is, is you pick a time and a date that works best for you. You fill out a little bit of a large form. It's just a bunch of questions so that I can understand your perspective of your own brand and business as it is now. Then I go ahead and take a deep dive. It takes me about a week or so to take a deep dive into your brand, touch every point of contact that somebody may have have about your brand, your business in terms of your virtual footprint. I analyze this. I take break it down of what your audience is seeing. And then I go ahead and make suggestions of this is your goal. These are some suggestions and adjustments I would suggest of how to get you there sooner rather than later. So if that sounds like something that you need, go ahead and go to that link in the show notes and be sure to use the code SPRING22 for savings. And that is going on till the end of May. So make sure you get over there and book that in. The appointment doesn't have to happen in May. It can happen whenever, but that code for savings does expire at the end of the month. End of the month. So let's get into today's interview. It's a little bit more about Ari. She is helping women-led brands in farm femtech, farm tech, femtech, and DTC transform their website into a platform that unlocks business opportunities. She serves as a branding UX consultant and professional peer in support of fellow female entrepreneurs through the number one ranked private business incubator in the world, 1871 Chicago. She's also the co-host of Halo Femtech Podcast, a podcast that honors disruptive innovators and change makers advancing women's health. Furthermore, she helps women in tech and design break into the industry and succeed in it by mentoring them for personal branding, career advancement, and entrepreneurship through interactive interaction design foundation and ADP list. Lots of big words in there. And without further ado, let's get into the interview. Welcome to the show, Ari. Hi. Thanks for having uh, me here. Yeah, of course. I'm excited about this. I have read about your journey, so I'm excited to hear about it firsthand. And I know we just heard a little bit about you in your intro, but I always like to ask in your own words, tell us a bit about the journey thus far and how you got to where you are today. 
Oh man, my journey. <laughs> you know, it's always like, you know, fascinating to go back and look at what I've done in the past, right? But I honestly started off as a graphic designer. Um, I was born Me too. in Bali. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know how I feel, right? About all these feelings <laughs> to graphic design and things like that. Um, you know, I, I didn't know what I wanted to be, to be honest with you, when I was growing up in Bali and I was surrounded by all things related to tourism until one day in high school, I finally realized, oh, I want to be a designer. And that's after I already got like a four year uh, full blown scholarship to go to tourism school. And I told the, the judges and my parents, like, I'm not going there. I'm going to be a graphic designer. And they're like, are you crazy? But, <laughs> you know, when you know that you want something and you know that you want to get there, you fight for it. Right. Yeah. And um, it truly shows. And I think and my parents finally like gave up. I was like, okay, fine, go to art school. And um, it was quite an interesting journey. I mean, for those who have been to art school, you know how it likes, right? We learn all things related to um, typography, colors, like communication, all different things, but you don't realize how does that going to really translate into the real world as you graduate. So mm -hmm. when I first got my actual job as a graphic designer, I felt like, okay, this is really cool. I finally, you know, was able to apply all the things that I know, but I felt something missing, right? It's like, what is this feeling that you just feel like, I think there's more to design. Yeah. I think there's more to like solving problem. And not until, you know, my husband at the time, he was my fiance, he asked me, okay, all right. He sounds like, you know, super excited with your work. I know you do great work on this, but how much do you really get paid? And yeah. I told him it was $250 per month. He was like, what really? Because he's coming from United States, right? Yeah. Of course that number is just ridiculous for him. You mean you add an under zero at the end? I'm like, no, just that two, five, zero. And he opened up this world to me, Danielle, like the world of freelancing, the world of, you know, digital nomad that you can mm -hmm. actually get work online. So I immediately, you know, learned all things related to web design, all things digital design. UI UX was pretty much booming at that time, just for, you know, the first time other designers hearing about it. And, you know, we see Facebook, right? All the other yeah. social media platforms with UI UX. And it really got me thinking, it was like, okay, there, there's more to design, not just like designing flyers, and just like business mm -hmm. card, but there's more to the thinking, right? There's more to finding solution for business to thrive, to really communicate their ideas, their messaging, and to create connection with the audience. So that's when I switched, to be honest with you, from just like being a graphic designer to um, digital designer and then all things UI UX and now into branding and UX strategy. Yeah. And actually, for those of us who don't really truly understand the definition of UX, I was hoping you could explain that to us. Yeah. Okay. UX. It's a big word for those who don't know what it is. User experience. Honestly, it's that um, simple sometimes, but we take it for granted, in my opinion, how the way we want to guide someone in any mm. experience, really, it's not always on just a digital platform or an app or a website, but also in real life, right? We take account in terms of like, if you were to go to a concert, for example, and you have no idea where to go to check in or to even like grab swag, maybe, or even like to go to the bathroom, there is no sign. What mm. do you do? You'll get frustrated. And I was like, what the where do I need to find information now? You don't want to deliver that kind of experience to anyone. And that's exactly what user experience is. It's not only all things related in the digital world. It's also something we sometimes experience in real life. We want to be guided, right? Sometimes, mm. you know, this is going to be a bit mean, but we are all lazy most of the time. It's like, I, yeah. tell me what to do. We'll just do it, right? Yeah. I just want to be guided. And I feel like everybody felt the same way because if you want to truly experience something with a brand or with, at, you know, at an event and things like that, you truly want to get the most out of it, right? Mm -hmm. And that's where user experience really come to play is to give you that experience so that you will stay with the brand. You will enjoy the time that you want to have in any type of situation related to that brand. 
So that's not even just for website, that's for a social media platform, phone to phone conversation, DM yeah. conversation, email conversation, anything that we are experienced through this brand, any brand should be catered towards us as the consumer in a sense. Yes, in a sense. Um, I would also say, you know, UX is very much tied with all things digital because digital is everywhere in our yeah. life. Right. But there's this very fine line between brand experience, user experience, and then customer experience. Essentially, user experience and customer experience is part of the bigger picture of brand experience. So okay. whenever a brand want to really deliver certain experiences, it needs to touch the customers, but it also needs to touch everybody's around it, which is the user. The user can be the end customer, but the user can also be the people in the company, like the employees mm. and everything, right? So it's, it can be like such a big topic. It is yeah. a big topic though, but it's so fascinating sometimes when you think about it, because we are definitely talking about relationship building, right? Experience building between people to people. So that's why it can be a bit tricky sometimes, but when you got it right, you'll feel, you know, you feel truly connected to the brand that knows exactly what you want, right? And how yeah. you guide you. This is so interesting too, because I mean, as a, I call myself a brand geek, as brand, two brand geeks sitting in a room, we could go in a million different ways on this topic for hours, right? But it's so interesting. I love when I've been studying this for, I don't know, six years now, and there's so many things I have yet to learn. And there, I have never heard that explained in that way in those three different sections between the customer the user and thus forth and I love that this industry is you're always going to learn something new and you're always going to be able to cater those experiences in a different way reflective of whatever the brand is or your own brand wants to represent I love I think it's like you said it's so fascinating and it's there's so it many is. rabbit holes to dive into and that could be dangerous in its own way, but it's, it's, <laughs> it's always like, if you are passionate about one section of it, you can make that work for you. And that's, yes, I love it. That's so cool. It's a good, dangerous um, a good dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> so actually this was not on my list, but I'm wondering if you'd answer this for us. Cause we're kind of getting into that web three. I don't know if you've dived into it at all. But what is your take on kind of like the future of everything we just talked about inside Web3? That's another hour long conversation. (laughs) Oh, my God. Yes, yes. And I myself, too, like relearning and new things all about Web3, right? Because I felt like it's fascinating in its own way, but it also like, hmm, I wonder how that will actually work, because there's just so many different layers now that we're really looking at all things experiences related to digital. We're talking about like privacy. We're talking about like cryptocurrency. Mm. And we're also talking about like, you know, security as well, right? And then creating some sort of like decentralized everything on digital. Like, how is that, what does that even mean for a lot of the brands, right? How is that going to deliver specific experiences, whether the good or bad? What are the good and bad experience? What do we need to you know, account for, or even like consider, there's just so many different, I would say, you know, thoughts and opinion right now out there. And I felt like I personally need to like really have a deep learning on this. And I don't have a full answer to that. Too, yeah, honestly. no, I, and I agree. I'm kind of just like opening yeah. this conversation to anybody who wants to talk about it. I personally have a note on my fold on my phone of links that I have to read that I have not yet read because I know when I start, I won't be able to stop about the research and what we should be doing. You know what I can share though? Um, I think it was yesterday. Yesterday, Jacob Cass, um, he's also a guy that is pretty much well-known in the branding space, right? Um, He created a cool workshop with another guy Mm. who knows all things about NFT related. And I found that was really interesting because as a designer myself too, like I kind of want to be in the space, like creating NFT, but it was even more interesting when they shared about how branding could also play a role in creating an an NFT, Mm. not just about creating something, but what do you tell the story behind the NFT piece, right? Yeah. What is the mission behind creating the NFT to create more of a story that, you know, user at the end of the day would be, would feel like they appeal to it. They feel connected to the NFT and thus buy from you. 
So I thought that was interesting. And I love that you brought that up because so much of what we talk about here in addition to branding is that story piece of it. And if we yes. can, going back to what you were saying before about this kind of human connection that this experience provides, people don't want to buy from logos. They want to buy from humans. Yes. So it'll be interesting to see how this human experience translates to such a non-human form. <laughs> <laughs> but those stories, attaching those stories to NFT is definitely, if anybody is doing it right now, make sure your NFT or whatever you're doing has a story attached. Cause that's definitely, at least for me as a consumer, who's going to start dabbling around, that would be something that's more interesting and enticing to me if it has a story attached for sure. Um, so moving on here, <laughs> right turn. Um, what do you feel like a business that what do you feel is the way for a business to properly embody a brand experience more on a personal level though we're big about personal branding here um so how can people start acting like more of a human in their brand and offering that human connection experience throughout their brand if they're not doing that already yeah that's a really good question i was talking with another brand strategist a few weeks ago and we talked about how to truly living it, right? Live your brand. And I think that's definitely a lot easier said than done hmm. because all of us have values. And sometimes we just like put those values on the wall and forget about it, right? And on the other hand, you would you know, share this with everybody in your, you know, your, in your company, you with your um, customers and everything. And then again, you don't truly really practice it. But when you truly do want to, create a brand that would leave remarks or even like, you know, everlasting experience to your customers. You need to live it. What do I mean by that? Say that you have like, let's say a few different values for your brand. Maybe your brand is more on the, you know, respect um, or maybe transparent or down to art. Just making up right now, right? Mm -hmm. Making that up right now. But the point is for you to truly live it. If you say that you are truly respectful to others and everybody inside your brand need to be respectful for others, then do so. What does that mean? That means that if you said that you're going to meet at a certain time, then meet at a certain time. Don't let everybody else is hanging, right? Without any explanation or stuff like that. So again, going back to like really living your brand, like how do you, you know, can, consecutively with one another truly living the brand values that you have starting from us as the founder right mm. if you are a one person show right now that's fine but you need to be the example that can truly show this is how the brand live right here are our values and then when you start growing whether it's through the customer base or even your own internal team you'll start telling people like, this is how we do things in the company. This is our culture. We strive because X, Y, and Z values, right? Yeah. That's how you build them bit by bit, but you have to start living it rather than just like telling people, yeah, here's what we have. Here's our value. But they're just like a pretty words on a website right. or somewhere in your document. Right. Like other than just checking it off the box and the foundational work, you have to actually live it. Yeah. Yes. Totally. So is this what you help your clients with? Or tell us a bit more about what you do with your clients. That's a good one. You know, we do so many different things. Yeah. <laughs> but it all it all started with the brand, right? We often feel like the brand is definitely where your, you know, the heart of your company. Yeah. Right. Everything starts with the heart. And when we start working with our clients, it all starts with the strategy first. When they don't have a clarity about where it is that they want to go with their brand or who the brand even is, when they take themselves out from the brand, can the brand truly really live on its own? Mm. What happened if they ended up Ooh. like selling the company, right? And then, or maybe they outgrew the company and it just not because of themselves anymore. They have like more people within the company. What yeah. then? Yeah. So I think a lot of time, you know, entrepreneurs don't have a clear idea of like, how, how do I work with my brand? They have the idea, they want to market it straight away, but without yes. <laughs> understanding the foundation of the brand, right? How would you have the clarity in targeting the right target audience and delivering the right messaging to these audience? I felt like if you were to do, you know, a quick 
shortcut and you still go straight to market um, your company, you might have spent way too many um, or too much you know, investment on the wrong place simply because then you're going to have to go back again to the branding and trying to figure out, oh, that didn't work because we weren't targeting the right customers. Well, yeah. duh, that's why you should have done you know, branding first so that you can have that clarity before you go into market. Yeah. When you're, you or any of your clients, let's say they're launching a new course, a new product, mm-hmm. a new service, do you yeah. suggest doing a little bit of a brand audit before even touching the marketing of it? So yes, building the foundations of the course, building the foundations of the service, but then mm-hmm. going in and making sure it does match those brand values and those brand issues, issues <laughs> mission values and making sure it kind of all aligns to be able to shape yeah. this bigger picture you're trying to shape as a brand. Yeah. You know, sometimes businesses do specific things because of different circumstances, right? Yeah. Some startups would say that, oh, we need to test everything first. That's fine. But knowing that they will have to still go back to the brand exercise, doing the strategy again in the future, as long as they know that, I think it's pretty much, you know, do whatever you need to do, right, essentially. But oftentimes what I found the most successful for different startup founders or even like, you know, the brands that we work with, they have a clarity first in order to target who are we really targeting? What is the impact we want to create for them first? So that as a brand, they know how to speak to these, uh, to these target audience, right? If you were to just like target everybody, imagine how much funds you're spending on different places that might not give you any return in investment. Mm. So to me, it almost like you're trying to be very strategic in terms of like, where do you want to go with your company? Who it is that you truly wanted to target? And the most importantly, like, how are you trying to influence their decisions to go to you, to whether connect or, you know, buy from you, or even maybe at the end of the day to advocate for you. And mm. that's a longer conversation. And you can't really just like throw in some ads money yeah. out there and hopes anybody that feel relevant to it will catch it. Right. But what if you can actually target specific type of people with your ads? And that's going to make a huge more impact compared to just like casting a wide net. Yeah. So what are maybe two to three action steps that somebody can be taking across different platforms? You can focus on website or social media or anything else to focus on that. I don't want to say tunnel vision user experience, but that consistent Mm. user user experience that speaks to accurately speaks to their brand. Yeah. Are you familiar with user journey, Danielle? I I am. Yes. I always ask the questions like I am not because I don't know (laughs) if who, who is aware and who isn't on the the audience. Okay. For those who don't know what user journey is, it's honestly a visual map of how your target audience would, you know, experience certain thing with you or with your brand or with your business, right? Think of it this way. The principle is rather simple, right? There's AIDA. So awareness, interest, desire, and then action. When they first find out about you, how would they find out about you? So really thinking about like areas of maybe communication or channels and, you know, touch points around you that you can leverage so people can get to know you. Maybe it's through word of mouth or maybe it's through Facebook groups or maybe even like, you know, um, Google ads, right? How would they first find out about you? And if you look at your, you know, user persona and user persona is honestly means, you know, your target audience that you kind of curate so that you have a clear idea, you know, who this, these people are, men, women, yeah. you know, age, um, their background, psychographic and their needs, wants, hopes, and dreams. So if you have at least, you know, some of this information, you at least can have a sense of what would they do if they want to find X, say that you sell, Let's just say like, you know, some winter boots, okay? Making up things right now, winter boots. So you have winter boots and you're trying to sell more winter boots this year. And for those of the target audience you want it to attract, they would most likely be, you know, a fashionable woman um, who maybe lives in the city, right? And you're targeting these type of women and they would most likely, you know, search online and you know their habits are gonna be typing online, finding for, you know, amazing winter boots for whatever season in specific city. 
And you know that they're going to come through, you know, Google ads because they search. So you have some like awareness journey already for these particular people, where they'd be coming from. And from there, you have this set of journey created and designed for them, whether you you know, have them coming from the website, sorry, not the website, coming from the Google ads into the website. And then from the website, maybe into other pages that you have in your mm -hmm. current pages. So I think, you know, we can talk all day about this and we can also share some resources later. But the point really is to have a dedicated insights of what you want to do and how you would want to guide your user in every step of the way, right? So when do you want them to really connect with you? When do you want them to buy from you? How do you know they would want to buy from you? Is there a specific information that they would need mm. to consider you before they buy from you? For example, I don't know about you, Danielle, I love seeing reviews and I felt like mm -hmm. if I don't see reviews or even like, you know, real people posting um, a product and posting that in their reviews, yeah. I just feel like, mm, is this even legit, right? Yeah. So what do they need to account for? Is it the reviews? Is it the social proof? Is it everything else? You need to help provide those so that they feel confident that you are either legit or, you know, they feel like you are connected to them and potentially be able to deliver what they need. Yeah, absolutely. So I feel like it all starts with understanding your brand, understanding everything we've talked about, the mission, the value, what you provide, what you can help with, and then understanding mm -hmm. the actions almost of the client and what, and almost predicting their steps of like, okay, if they come through Google ad, what are they going to do next? What do I want them to experience? And how do mm -hmm. I help them get the most out of that experience of that? Um, so personal question for you. So you moved from Bali to the United States. How long ago did you move? 11 years now. Okay. So I started my business probably, I guess, four years ago. And it was during mm -hmm. the time where everyone was trying to move to Bali. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Like everyone was trying to work remotely, build a business, work remotely, and just move to Bali or spend a month or two in Bali. So have you been back since then during this kind of work and travel from wherever? And what was that experience like for you? Yeah, gosh, you know, the last time I was home, 2018. So it's been okay. a while. I'm hoping to come back this year, you know, for the summer. We'll see. And, you know, here's what I'm going to say. Having a digital business is really fascinating and also has a lot of perks, right? Um, not only talking about, you know, flexibility around scheduling, and, you know, you can work from anywhere, but also around uh, flexibility of gaining more profit, to be honest with you, mm. comparing to other types of business, right? When you have a digital service or honestly service, um, you know, business, you have less to worry about um, that basically going to take away your profit and you don't have inventories, right? And I think that yeah. it's just the beauty of it. And I felt like this is a bliss in a way. And um, I cannot wait until we will be able to travel again because you can yeah. literally work from anywhere. If you want to be a digital nomad, you can certainly do that. Yeah, that's awesome. And I also read that you work with your husband. <laughs> yes. Do you guys, do you guys run the business together or does he just kind of help out here and there? We run the business together. He is my business partner, um, you know, for the better or for worse, right? <laughs> and um, it, it's been quite interesting because I did not know what I was signing myself up for because we literally, you know, got married. And then he asked me, hey, would you want to be my business partner? I was like, mm, sure. What's the worst yeah, that what can am I going to do? <laughs> <laughs> Bad idea, by the way. But um, we did figure things out, you know, our first few years of, Oh, goodness, building the business together was a hot mess because we were just like telling each other what to do and mm. there were no boundaries and no, you know, clear set of roles and things like that. But eventually we figure it out because eventually we feel like yeah. we want to stay together with the business and we, we're complementing each other very mm -hmm. well, right? Because he's on the nerd side and I'm more on the creative <laughs> side. And there's probably so many opportunities. I, my boyfriend works a little bit with the business now and there are so many opportunities that we see of like, okay, here's your skill and here's my skill. How do we yeah. make this bigger than, than, we, than yeah. we have 
maybe even expected, but there's definitely some learning curves that come, come oh, along yes. with it. <laughs> Um, so my last question before we kind of wrap up is what I, something I ask all of my guests of, we define the term on brand as kind of living and running your business from a place of alignment, truth to yourself, authentic. Yeah. So what we see is what we truly are as a person and a business. Was there a time in your life or your business where you weren't living on brand and how did you navigate back to realizing that? And then how did you navigate back to being on brand? Wow. That's a big question. You know, a few years ago, I think this is right around pandemic, to be honest with you. I was starting to really ask myself whether or not I have a voice, right? Sure. I went to different networking events, build up my own personal brand and also the company's brand, you know, sharing all of that and kind of get exposure. But I realized I don't really share what's in my head in terms of like my opinion, my perspective and everything in between. And one day, you know, my mentor, um, I'm, I'm part of this um, creative group called The Future Pro led by Chris Doe. And he would say, every one of you has a voice start sharing your voice. And that really hit me simply because I realized I wasn't really sharing my voice. Mm. I kept it to myself. So, you know, I think late last year, a good friend of mine finally talked me down in terms of like, Ari, you need to figure out your personal brand. I see you out there, but I don't think you truly embody your brand. Mm. And, you know, it was it was a light bulb moment for me, mainly because I should have done this a long time ago, but I refused to, you know, make amends with it or just like really accepting who I am. Yeah. And you know, that question when people ask you, so how are you unique? Goodness, I hated that question to be honest yeah. with you, Danielle, because I would often have no idea how to answer that. I mean, now I do know, but it took me a while to finally realize that I need to be at peace with myself, right? To really look at me as a person, like every single one of us, we have our own stories, we have our own characteristic, and we have different learnings throughout the time that we grew up. Take all of that and, you know, really look at like, how has the past shaped who you are today? And if there's anything that you feel is, you know, either traumatic or felt like you haven't made peace with it, do so. And maybe it's going to take you a while to accept that. And that is okay. But the more you start accepting who you are and, you know, being okay that you have certain strengths and weaknesses, it will become your truth, in my opinion. I know this is probably a bit woo-woo, but sorry. No, I love this. This is amazing. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> and, you know, I, I finally just feel like I accepted all the burdens that I had carried so mm. long because I was this, you know, one big sister for my two younger sisters. And my parents always say, are you going to be the example for your sister? Always, you know, stay focused, stay sharp, become, you know, the good example. And I was honestly feel burdened by that. I didn't realize until last year that my friend just took me through a personal philosophy exercise. And I realized I have my own strength and my parents shaped me to be who I am today. And I should leverage that. So yeah, it's, it's hard sometimes when you don't want to admit what you are not so good at, but when you do so, you realize how much other things that you are really good and very much um, have you know, great skills. Yeah. Your zone of genius. Yeah. I believe so strongly in, we don't know what we don't know until we do, we know it. Like, so we come so far in our lives, right. Knowing everything that we think we know. And then when we have these realizations, it's scary, but it's also liberating at the same time saying, okay, I, I can let that burden go. I can let that go. I'm free mm -hmm. to be who I am. Yes. speak my truth and live through that truth. And I'm so glad that you had that experience. And thank you for sharing that with us. You're very welcome. 
Um, so any last words or advice for the audience and definitely tell us where we can find more of you. You can find me more, honestly, online, <laughs> all over the place. You can find me on LinkedIn. You can find me on Instagram or even on my website, scaleph.com. Um, one last thing that I, I do wanted to share. I saw a post today from a thing, the founder, of, the founder of Spanx, right? And it made me realize that all of us, honestly, need to stop living somebody else's dream, right? And I would also say we need to be happy. So don't, you know, don't make somebody else's happy at the cost of your own happiness. Um, that's honestly it. I love it. That was so great. This has such been such a great conversation. We went like a total roller coaster from your journey to NFTs to all <laughs> these things. <laughs> um, I know that <clears throat> I definitely enjoyed it. I know the audience is going to enjoy it. Can't wait for them to hear. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing your experience, your expertise with us. We will chat with you soon.